actually bring me that paper? Um, before we get started, uh, one is that card that uh, Uncle Ernesto mentioned. If you could fill that out, we'd like to stay in touch with you. We've got stuff happening on the internet. We've got uh, things that we're making available and we're going to make available. So if you fill that card out and turn it in, we'd like to stay in touch with you. And also, if you have a prayer request, I keep a prayer request in my office and pray for them during the week. When I get too tired to study uh, and I, I get sleepy, I do push-ups and then I go through my prayer cards. And, uh, and it, it refreshes me. So if, you'll, if you will write down prayer requests, I want to pray for you. I wake up in the middle of the night praying for you, the ones that give me prayer requests. The other thing is I have these notes that I've been putting together. And this is the long version. And basically what this is, um, is the scripture verses that I'm using on the slides. And I'm printing them out. And then I have a couple of notes on the side, um, not much. But mostly it's the references that I'm using. And I have them printed out because when I make notes... I like highlighting things. So what I'm going to do is, is we're going to start printing these out every week, and we'll have the book of John in a binder. And, and you can get your notes from the next week when you, when you come up. They'll be over here. Clip them in your binder, and you can highlight the passages and go back. And when you want to read the book of John later, you'll have the references as well as the notes that were, you know, as well as the book. And then you can make notes in the margins and above and below. This takes me about five hours to produce every week. And so uh, I'm hopeful that it's useful to you. We're going to get binders and uh, charge probably 20 bucks for the binder with some pens and highlighters and all the stuff printed off. If you bring your own binder you can, and let us know, we'll print it off and you can have the things for free. What I want to make sure of is that there are there's some value to them so that we don't get a new binder every week and end up costing the church a bunch. Um, so, yeah, we'd love you to have those. They'll be available. I'll put a thing over here after church. If you want to put your name down, I'll have you a syllabus next week. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would open the word to us this morning, that you'd be magnified and lifted up. Fill me with faith and power and boldness to glorify your name. Father, I pray that you would open the scriptures to us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. John chapter 4. This is John chapter 4, part 2. We dealt with Jesus meeting the woman at the well last week. This week, we're going to start in verse 24. So John chapter 2, starting in verse... I mean, John chapter 4, starting in verse 24. It says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, and when he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now this is the first time that Jesus has made this bold declaration without ambiguity. He has said clearly, I am the Messiah, the Christ, the one that was prophesied to come, I am he. Now, it's interesting that he did not do this in Jerusalem. He did not do it in the temple. He didn't do this with the Pharisees. He made this declaration to a Gentile woman or a, a mixed-race woman that was partly Jew and that he said is not part of the children that I've come to, the Samaritans. He said that, but, but he's, he's made this declaration to her, and we can see the faith in these people that is different than was, what took place in Jerusalem. So I think it's fascinating. This is one of the three times that he plainly makes this declaration. Moving on in verse uh, 27, chapter 4, verse 27. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now when Jesus came to her and started speaking with her, and, and she wants to argue with him, and he says, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, yeah, I know, you've had five, and the one you're living with is not your husband. Her response to that was, you say we ought to worship here, 
or worship in Jerusalem. And I say we ought to. So it was an intellectual doctrinal argument that she responded to with his supernatural insight and knowledge. But when he said, I am the Christ, she got excited and she left her water pot. This is not something you go to Walmart and pick up another one. There's a significant investment of time and energy into getting a water pot that you can drop 30 feet and fill with water and pull back up. Whether it's a wooden bucket or whether it's a clay pot that's been filled on a rope, this represents a significant investment, and she leaves it and she runs off. She got excited about what Jesus had told her. This shows us the difference in faith that this woman had than what the Pharisees had. It was not a sign that got her excited. It was the word of Jesus Christ saying, I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. So when he tells her this, she runs and she tells the men to come and see Jesus, to come and see who, who this was. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When we come to Jesus Christ, just like these people in Samaria, we come to him, not the other way around. I saw an excellent documentary between two atheists one time. It was one atheist interviewing another atheist about how much they hate Christianity, and I thought this will be fascinating. So, I watched an hour and a half of this interview, and it was, it was fascinating to understand the insight of what goes on. And one of these guys was a Nobel Prize, Prize winning physicist. And after 45 minutes of talking and carrying on and this and that, the, the interviewing atheist says to the physicist, he says, why if so many, how, why is it so many of your fellow physicists are Christians and proclaim that there's a God? when you show clearly that science proves that there isn't. And this physicist said, well, he said, science answers the question of how, but not why. Whereas faith answers the question of why, but not how. In other words, science answers that the world turns, the sun stays still, and the motion of the earth changes the evening and the morning and creates day and weather cycles. Faith tells us that God created light and divided the light and the darkness. So faith tells us what happened, why it happened, that God chose this to be, but it doesn't tell us how it happened. Science can sometimes tell us how. Now, if they conflict, science is wrong. If science conflicts with the Word of God. But what this, what this physicist pointed out was that we can observe what's taking place, but not why, why it's there. And so he said to him, if that's the case, why are you so dogmatic about preaching atheism? Why do you travel around and campaign for this stuff and talk to people? And this old physicist atheist said, well, the idea that there is an all-powerful, almighty God that says, I've created everything, and if you want to have a relationship with me, you have to come to me and do it my way, just makes me mad. And the other atheist stood up and raised his arms and said, absolutely, that's exactly it, isn't it? You know, the problem is not knowledge. The problem is that if you want to come to Jesus Christ, you come to Jesus Christ. That means you turn your back on what you're doing, where you're at, who you are. That's called repentance. You repent and you move to Jesus. You come to him, that's what these people did. Look at some of the things that he says. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus says, you're out seeking money and wealth and clothes and property. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Stop worrying about being, having the things that you need and worry about seeking God. This is something that you do. You seek after him. You come to him. You look for him. John chapter 12, verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, Jesus says... And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus said, like the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up, if the Son of Man is lifted up and put up on a cross, I'll draw all men to me. You know, when the serpent was put up, you had to get out of your tent, move across a large camp to see the serpent. The serpent didn't move. You had to stop what you were doing. 
what you were fiddling with, what you were talking, your conversations, and you came to the serpent to see it, and you were healed. If you come to Jesus, he'll heal you, but you have to come to him. You have to be willing. So many people are waiting, and, and they, they've got their bottle of alcohol, and they're saying, Jesus, take it from me. God, if you don't want me to have it anymore, take it from me. Take the desire for this away from me. The drugs, they're saying, God, I, I don't like this. I met a young woman who came on the property. I talked to her for a few minutes, and she was twitching from the meth, and I started witnessing to her, and she said she turned tricks to get meth. She's maybe 17, about my daughter's age. I was brokenhearted for her, and I said, do you want that? Do you want to be free? Oh, I want to be free. Well, I can tell you how. Come and, and meet the, the man at church who, who helps with addiction and meet Jesus who will free you. And she left. She came and met for a little while and left and didn't come back. But she said, I, I want somebody to take this from me, but Jesus says, come to me. I'm not saying you have to heal from the alcohol and the drugs before you come to Jesus, but come to Jesus. Come and seek him. Come to the church, come to the person that says, hey, I've got a message, get in the word of God, get in prayer and seek Jesus. Seek him in your life, come to him and he'll save you and deliver you. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A fellow I grew up with, righteous man, Amish fella, extremely righteous, upright, godly, giving, holy man, spent his life seeking God, told me he got born again when he read this passage, and he was seeking God so hard through his teenage years and through his young adults in his 20s, and, and he, was, he was so broken that he could not get God to come into his life. And he, and he drove a buggy, and he got rid of cell phone, and he, and he didn't have electricity, and, and he wore the right clothes with buttons and not a zipper, and, and with sleeves and not short sleeves, and, and combed his hair a certain way, and, and talked a certain way, and did all of the things to get God to come into his life, and it didn't work. So he tried harder. He gave money away, and he, and he, and he did righteous works, godly things in his life, and he prayed, and God wouldn't come into his life. And he was so broken, and he's reading the word, and he read this. And he realized he's trying to get God to come to him. He's not going to God. And God's saying, come to me and take my yoke and put that nonsense down. And I'll give you my yoke. And it's easy and it's light. We talked about a broken cistern last week. All the religions of the world are, are designed to make you acceptable to God so that he'll come and meet you. You know that? If you're, a, if you're a Hindu, your life is in fear, in bondage, so that you're acceptable to the higher powers, to what's next, so that you don't offend, so that these gods will have to do with you and be good to you. If you're a Catholic, all of your work, all the things that you do, the things that you say and pray, and the things that you eat and drink and where you go and and ash and all these different things that you do, you do to become acceptable so that God will meet with you. God says, you're never going to be acceptable. Come to me, just like you are. You have a burden that you can't unload. Come to me, and I'll give you my burden, and it's light. It's a wonderful yoke. John chapter 7, verse 37, in the days of the feast, that great in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Come to Jesus, and he will give you living water. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Come to Jesus and take the water of life. Friends, today, if you don't know Jesus, it's time to come to him, to cast off those works and just come to Jesus. John chapter 4, verse 31, moving on. In the meanwhile, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. So Jesus is sitting on this well, 
up on top of the mountain by Jacob, by Jacob's well. He's sitting up there. The disciples come back with food. The woman runs off and leaves her water pot. The disciples say, hey, we left to get supper. You were tired. You stayed here. Have some food. We've got some fish here maybe. We've got some rye bread. We've got uh, whatever food. They said, we've got something. Have a bite to eat. Jesus is just walking up there, and he's thinking, and, and he goes, I have something to eat you don't even know about. And they think he's mad at him. And therefore the disciples say to one another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? And Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus said, The thing that's filling my soul is that I get to do what God has sent me to do and to finish his work. Guys, remember this. When Jesus came, he was God. He was God Almighty, the Son of God. And he said that what he was doing was God's work. Friends, the work that we do as Christians is not our work. I have to remember this because I carry the burden of the work that we're doing here. Because I stay up at night praying, anguishing over the church and the things that are going on in it and, and the folks that are in the church. But it's not my work. It's God's work. And he'll sustain it or not sustain it, not me. I'm a laborer. I do what he tells me to do when he tells me to do it, and do it with all of my heart and soul. But it's his work. Remember that. There's so much rest in that. There is also a cessation of self. If the work grows and expands and is wonderful, it's still not my work. If it's filled with joy and people singing, it's still not my work. It's still God's work. It's what he's doing. I'm just a laborer. Whether I'm sweeping the floor or preaching, I'm just a laborer. Say not, there are four months, there are yet four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already into harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So the disciples say, are you hungry? No. Why not? Because I have something to eat that you don't know about. What, did somebody else bring you food? And he says, look at the fields. He said, don't look at them and think, okay, it'll be four months till it's time to harvest. When wheat grows, it's green, it's green, it's green. And then it puts out all these little hairs around the, the grain of wheat. And when those hairs die, the field turns from green to white in like a couple of days. Corn is very nearly the same. When, it's, when it gets ripe and it releases all of its pollen and it all comes out and those, those heads turn white, the, the field just changes. You can smell it. It becomes ready to harvest. Jesus says, don't look out and say it's not ready to harvest yet. He says, the field is white, all ready to harvest. And he's talking about the people. He says, harvest, and when you bring it in, you'll bring in meat for eternal, eternal matters. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, the passage we all know, the Great Commission. Jesus says, go ye into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. This is the last thing that Jesus tells the disciples. Go into all the world and preach. Do you understand the onus that this puts on us, friends? He says, if you'll go and preach, the ones that believe will be saved. The ones that don't believe will be damned. What if you don't go preach? What if you don't tell anybody? They're going to be damned. The only thing that's standing between these people and hell is us. It was the disciples at this time, and it's us today. I read a book. Uh, it was a lecture given by the major Ivy League colleges in the United States in 1904, I think. And they were discussing missions. This was back when God was still very much present in these schools. And I think it was Harvard and the missions director in Harvard said, guys, there is no reason we won't reach the world in our generation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, it is so easy. You can get on a steamboat in New York Harbor today. You can make it to Africa in just a week or two. You can get on a train and be in the heart of Africa in like three and a half weeks. He had it all timed out. He said, it's so incredibly easy. Can you imagine these guys today? We still haven't done it. And we tell them we can get on a jet and be in the heart of Africa with penicillin. It hadn't been invented yet. With malaria medicine. 
and with quick access to medical doctors in a pickup truck and an air conditioner in about 16 hours. There's no reason not to reach the world in our generation except that we don't do it. Jesus said, go ye into all the world, the fields are white. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. You know, before this, ha- before this statement, that hadn't been true. Before Jesus died and was raised again, Jesus didn't have the power to point to somebody and say, become a son of God just by faith until he died and his blood was shed, until that blood was put before the mercy seat in heaven and sins could be forgiven. At this point, Jesus said, because I've died and raised again, now all power is given to me in heaven and earth. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Jesus says, the field is white, my friends. You know, the message hasn't changed. And neither, I spelled neither wrong, sorry. And neither have the principal agents. The message that God gave, that Christ gave the disciples, has not changed since he gave the message. And neither have the agents that that do it. You know, Jesus said to the disciples, go. That's still the message, go. To you, go. And to all the world, when you preach, they'll hear. Go to all the world and preach the gospel. You know, it hasn't changed. We think, well, missions has changed, things have changed. It's, no, it hasn't. It's the same. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And when you do, Jesus will save them. It's his work, not yours. It's his yoke, not yours. It's his message, not yours. You're just taking the message. You're not responsible to save the whole world. You're responsible to tell the whole world. This is our responsibility today. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 says, How then... Shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That's a relevant question. How are they going to call on somebody they haven't believed on? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Somebody's got to go or they won't hear. If they don't hear, they won't believe. If they don't believe, what did he say is going to happen? They're going to be damned. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I want to tell you a story about a missions trip. I thought and thought about how to teach this passage about the fields being white into harvest. And I think teaching about what you guys did two years ago is important. Three years ago. When you sent us to the Philippines with Auntie or Linda. I know we've given our Philippine report, but I want to remind you what took place. You sent us over to the Philippines, to the island of, of Cebu, right over here in the middle of the Pacific. That 1040 window that's basically what you see there is about 90% of the unreached peoples in the world. There's about 3.5 billion people that haven't been reached in that window that still need the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, the gospel's been in the Philippines for a long time. Look at the statistics that come off of Wikipedia. In the Republic of the Philippines, there is about 100 million people it is the 12th most populated country in the world, this, this small nation there in the Pacific. About 80.58% by census identify themselves as being Roman Catholic, while 1.8% are Protestants. That's when they fill out the cards as on the census. This is in 2010. There's a lot more Muslims today and less Catholics. There's also a lot more that don't identify as anything. They're atheists. They've got cell phones and Facebook. Tagalog and English are the official languages of the country. You can go to the Philippines right now as a missionary and start preaching tomorrow in English with translators in different places. 80% of the people there are Catholics that, that say we're Christians and we believe in Jesus. Half of the work's already done. They already know who Moses is. They already know what the law is. They're already under the law and trying to keep it, but they have not got the yoke of Jesus Christ. They're dying. I held little children in my arms in a landfill filled with scabies living in trash heaps that did not have the message of Jesus Christ. That heard it for the first time when we were there. Man, we got such a small number. Guys, the world's falling apart. 
there's so many people right now dying and on their way to hell because we haven't listened to John chapter 4 when he said the fields are white already to harvest. In a couple of weeks, we get to have a display in the tent. Right down here at Farm Fair, I hope every one of you that are still on the island are at that thing every day, praying and giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. People get saved every year. Do you understand the magnitude of somebody that's moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light? And the joy that's found in doing that, Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Because I get to do this, friends, we get to do this. Be there, young, old, tired, be there. Cebuano or Basaya is spoken by about 20 million people in the Philippines. That's where the people that we went to, got to go to. You know, there's a, what, around 2 million people in Hawaii? Ten times the number of people that are on our islands are in Cebuano. I mean, in, in uh, uh, Cebu, or in that area that speaks Cebuano language. 80% of those people are Catholic. Another 19% of them are various and sundry other things. 1.8% are Christians. Do you understand now the field that's there, the low-hanging fruit? The Cebu Island that we went to has around 3 million people on it. We took a measly 10,000 picture Bibles that explained the story of Jesus very simply, and we gave it to churches to give to their, their people that could read them. We gave away about 2,000 good quality Bibles. One of the guys that we gave Bibles to had a little church that didn't have money to get a building for $100 a month, so instead they met under an overpass. They had a Bible study, and they only had one Bible, so they traded back and forth. We gave them 10 Bibles for about 30 people that meet under the bridge. We gave them good and evils, and when I left, I gave him my computer and projector and screen so he could show the Jesus film in the area that he was. Man, he was so excited for the tools to go back, to take the gospel of Jesus. Guys, the fields are white. We need to go. We worked with around 750 churches. Auntie Erlinda took us over there and got us hooked up with these churches. So we got to preach in pastor's conferences and work with churches everywhere we went. We got to lo work with a local church. We didn't go in and give away Bibles we went in and gave Bibles to people for them to give away because they were going to be there to pray and to love and to teach after we were gone. We fed about 5,000 kids little plates of chicken and rice. What a blessing that was. It's not eternal. They're going to be hungry in a week. But let me tell you, we gave children that are five and six years old chicken that said they'd never had it before. They took one chicken leg and split it three ways so they could bring it home to their siblings that didn't get to come. You know, Jesus looked at the hungry people and he had compassion. He didn't feed them because he wanted them to stay so he could preach to them. He was done preaching. He fed them because they were hungry. The fields are white, friends. We preached the gospel over 30 times while we were there. Individual times that I got to stand and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most of the people I preached to were Catholics and didn't know the gospel of Jesus Christ. We showed the Jesus film to over a thousand kids at night. Many other people, we, couldn't, we didn't count them all, but the low estimate was 1,000. Our trip, when we got done, we bought our tickets. Other people bought their tickets. Other people donated for books. Other people sent things. We, I estimated the total that we spent was around $65,000. It wasn't nearly all from this church, but some of it was. Some of it came from, from my labor. Some of it came from, from Jim and Erlinda's. Other people gave $65,000, and we got to do all that. Guys, the fields are white to harvest. I came back and I started figuring it out and I started wondering, what could I buy in the United States with $65,000? I looked it up this week. The brand new 2020 Corvette is called the New Pride of America. It's a beautiful car, mid-engine, fast. The base model's around $65,000. We could have stayed home and bought that instead of preaching to these guys. We got to go into this prison it was super crowded. I got a table, a card table, and pulled it up. There were guys pressed in in front and behind, and we were locked in there with them. They were so close, I couldn't, I couldn't, of course, I'm taller than everybody, but I couldn't 
get distance so that I can gesture. I like gesture when I'm preaching. So I pull over this rickety card table and I kind of surf on top of it. And I get up there and I preach the gospel and I look around at these drug dealing garden criminals and about a dozen of them are weeping because they had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 6 verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break in nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, I like Corvettes. They're pretty. Especially the red ones like that. I'd like to drive a Corvette. I never have. I never will. My treasure is not here. My treasure is in you guys. My treasure is buried in the heart of the kids at the farm fair in Anahola. My treasure is in the Philippines with these little kids that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. My treasure is finding it in the word of God and teaching it to others so that they'll tell others. It's what gets me excited. It's what fills my soul and makes me happy. I call this a kingdom mindset. Being mindful of the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of God, and seeking it first, and seeking its treasure first. And you know, it changes you having that kingdom mindset. Friends, the onus is on us that we all of us live our lives and seek first the kingdom of God, to seek his righteousness first. And if that's what we're doing, it eliminates many other roles, roads, and paths in our lives, things that we could do. You know what? I cannot be rich and do what I do. I can't have money and do what I do. I can't have an air conditioner in my bedroom and do what I do. I can't afford the electricity. I can't drive a new truck and do what I do. I can't seek the kingdom of God first and be able to also seek my kingdom first. I'm not giving myself kudos, guys. I love every minute of what I do. I am like filled every day by getting to teach and preach and understand and study the word of God and to give it to others. I love that. I want you to love it too. In order to choose to seek Christ first, we must choose not to seek other things first. 90% of the effect this has on your life will be physical. Christians, so often we spiritualize everything. And we say, oh, I'm going to seek God's kingdom first. So that means to my life of busyness, I'm going to add uh, 15 minutes of prayer time when I'm on my way to work. I'm not telling you to stop working. I'm not telling you to quit everything and do, I'm not telling you to do anything particular. I am saying seek God's kingdom first so that when it comes to that job, that job is subject to the kingdom of God. How does this work? We have farm fair coming up. If you're too busy to go down and preach the gospel to people that are standing there waiting for their children's faces to get painted, then you're not seeking God's kingdom first. That's heavy. If your job is too busy... If your surfing's too busy, if your TV program's too important, if whatever it is, waxing the car, going for a walk, exercising, is too important to make it to a chance to preach the Word of God to people that haven't heard it, you're too busy to seek God's kingdom first. Seek His kingdom first. Now, if you're not, that's okay. Not for me. Not if you are walking by faith and not by sight. But most people don't. I'm glad to get to preach to you. But friends, find the freedom, the joy, the privilege that it is to see the white fields and to seek that kingdom first. I'm kind of passionate about this, friends. Okay? This, this is... I, I turned 18 on the mission field. 
When I talk about people dying and going to hell, it's not abstract. I've seen them. I sat in Mexico, in Honduras, in a, in a little roundabout area in the, middle of, uh, in the middle of town. And my wife and I sat there and we prayed for the kids. And they would come by and we would give them suckers or whatever we had. And I'd, I'd lay my hand on the head of this child and I'd pray for him and I didn't speak Spanish. And I couldn't preach to him and it, oh, I hated that. And when I talk about the fields that are white and the people that are going, I remember the faces of these kids. I remember what their hair felt like. I remember walking through the bazaar in Bangkok, Thailand, and seeing all the baubles that were for sale and having the kids pass me and know that it's a cultural faux pas, but I didn't care. I put my hands on the heads of the kids when they passed, and I prayed, God, send somebody. God, send somebody. God, the fields are white, send laborers. It's very personal to me. John chapter 4, verse 35. Say ye not, there are yet four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit to life eternal. Both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Friends, we told you why we need to. Here's what you get. You get to obey Jesus. And you get reward. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul says, I've planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. It's not my ministry, it's his. It's not my harvest, it's his. But I, I laid foundations and Apollos watered them. Verse 7, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 7. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Paul said, listen, I'm going to be rewarded for planting. Apollos is going to be rewarded for watering. God's going to get the increase of this. You know God's not a socialist? You know that God gives people rewards differently? Some people have more rewards than others. He actually said, if you're faithful in a little, I'll make you a ruler over much. He said, if I give you some talents and you bury them and you don't spend them, I'm not going to get done. Thank you, dear. I'm not going to get done and come back and take away from the guy that's got more and give them to you because you don't have as many. I'm going to take away you because you don't have as many. I'm going to take them away from you and give them to the guy that's got the most. He's not a socialist. He rewards people according to their labor. The labor is to go and plant and water, to tell people about Jesus, to teach people. Verse 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Paul says, Apollos and I are working with God. He's got the blueprints, but we're laborers. We're, we're hammers and nails, and we're putting this thing together, but it's God's building. He says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. Paul says, God's given me this insight and knowledge, and I've taken it, and I've laid a foundation that is Jesus Christ. I've taught you things, because I'm a, I'm a master builder. I'm an apostle. I've been granted this from God. It's his building, but I hear, I'm doing it. And he says, but let every man take heed how he builds on the foundation. So he says, I've laid this foundation, and other men are going to come and build on the foundation I've laid, which is the word of Jesus the, the gospel, but be careful how you build on it. But Paul says, I've come in and preached the gospel. People have gotten saved, but they need more than that. They need to be taught. They need to be discipled. So other people are coming to disciple, but he says, don't do it wrong. There are people that will come and build on the foundation that I've laid that is Jesus, but be careful how you do it. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, that's if any man comes and builds on the foundation of Jesus Christ that I've laid, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. So he says, if you come and you build or, or disciple on top of that knowledge of Jesus, whether it's an awesome building gold, gilded in gold or whether it's made out of hay, he says, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. The day of the Lord when the Lord comes and the Lord receives us all back to heaven, he's going to decide whether the thing that has been built that you've discipled is worth anything or not. 
If your discipling is worth anything, you're going to create converts that create converts. That's the end goal, that, that we reproduce as Christians. And if not, he says, your building's not worth anything. It's going to get burned up. Every man's work shall be made manifest. That's the work of building on this foundation. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So he says this, this discipling, this teaching that Apollos is doing, when, he, when God comes back and he sees if he's built, if he's built a church that's vibrant and growing, then he says, he, Paulus is going to get a particular reward for that. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. If your work doesn't do any good, if it's not winning people, if it's not changing people's lives, and those people aren't actually saved. Now, here's what that looks like. If you're a, a TV evangelist, and you've got a church of 10,000 people, and these people come out because you have charisma, and a big building, and a big budget, and, and you preach, they need to give you money, give you money, and you end up with 10,000 people and you get to heaven, you say, God, I am ready for my reward. Man, I have, been, I have been drawing crowds for 30 years. You should see, God, the jet that I have. It's incredible. You know, and I've got these six Mercedes. They all match my suits and so on. And God says, you know what? Let's try your work. Let's see how that looks. Let's set fire to it. Of those 10,000 people, 400 of them were saved. They got saved by this little guy down here who was preaching on the street, and by this guy over here, and they came to your church, got confused, and they didn't reproduce. He said, I'm burning all your works. They're all worthless to me. All of that big mess that you made, and all that stuff that you got, money, and he said, I don't care about it. I care about my kingdom and my work, not yours. So you see, there is reward for seeking the kingdom of God first. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered... And the time of my departure is at hand, Paul says. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love is appearing. Paul says there's a crown of righteousness that God has that he's going to give to me and put on my head, but not just to me, but everybody that loves is appearing. That's not Paul's righteousness. That's Christ's righteousness. That's a crown that we get for believing in God and for coming into his kingdom. But there's more crowns. James chapter 2, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he was tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised them that love him. 1 Peter chapter 5, Feed the flock of God, 5 2, which is among you, taking oversight thereof, down to verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away going to get a particular crown of glory revelation 4 4 and around about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats i saw four and twenty elders seated or sitting and clothed in white raiment and they had on their head crowns of gold multiple crowns see god's got these interlocking crowns i don't know that they're interlocking that's my guess that you you put the first one on that's the crown when you get born again and maybe another one that's a crown of glory and i don't know what they are but he's got these crowns that he gives people that serve him, people that go to the farm fair and give the gospel, people that give gospel to the people on the airplane, people that hand out tracts that go to other nations that, that come early and put chairs down, sweep floors, do whatever they can for the kingdom of God. He said, I've got crowns for these guys. And when they come in, I'm going to come and talk to you and say, son, you've done so well. Daughter, you've done so well. Have these crowns, and I'm going to give you these crowns. And, and in 10,000 years... In 100,000 years, you're going to be walking, and people will, oh, wow, you did this, this, and this. I can count your crowns. Now, what do you do with them? He says that in that day, there's going to be four and 20 elders, 24 people sitting or in chairs around the thrones, and Jesus is going to start talking. And the elders are going to get up, and they're going to take the crowns that Jesus gave them, and they're going to throw them back at Jesus' feet because he's worthy of all glory and honor. We know that. We know we don't deserve a crown. We know when we go to uh, some India and preach and teach the gospel and are abused and end up dying for the cross when we lose children, and we don't deserve a crown because he's done it all. But he's going to give us one, and we get to give it back. Friends, I hope I have one or two or five. 
to throw at the feet of my Savior. I'm looking forward to sitting in those chairs or standing behind the guy sitting in those chairs or way back at the back of the crown and, crowd and just throwing that crown as hard as I can at the feet of Jesus. And then the worship service goes on and he picks them back up and he gives it back. Maybe next week you do it again. Friends, it's worth it. It's worth it to be involved. Matthew 10, 40, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet, the name of a prophet, shall receive a prophet's reward. There's a particular reward that's for a prophet. There's a crown, maybe, that interlocks in there that says prophet on it, that's, that's particular for that. But somebody that aids a prophet in his ministry and what he's doing also receives the crown for the prophet, receives a prophet's reward. You know, when I give money to missionaries, and I don't want them to ever tell me thank you. I'm getting their reward. He says, a righteous man, if you give, uh, he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man reward. If a righteous man comes and he has need and you put him up in your house because he's a righteous man, you'll get his reward. You'll get that crown that says a righteous man. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple. Verily I say unto you, he shall no wise lose his reward. If you, if you make it over there to the Philippines and you give that little kid a cup of cold water, then you'll not lose the reward for that. Revelation 3.11 says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which that thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You can lose these crowns. Some of the crowns can be lost by somebody teaching the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. But he, he says in 3.11, Revelation 3.11, to hold that crown, don't let it go. He says in Matthew 12.36 that for every idle word that men speak, they'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment. God is watching and judging, and the things that are spoken that are idle and stupid, that are wrong, God is judging for that and treasuring up wrath. He says, uh, Revelation 2 I mean, Romans 2, verse 5, But after the hardness and impotent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation uh, of the righteous judgment of God. So he says, because of the wickedness that you're doing, you're storing for yourself not treasure in heaven, but wrath against the day of wrath. The day of wrath is coming. And he says, some of you have buckets full of wrath up there that you've treasured up that God's going to come and put on you. Why? Because he's a righteous judge. But Paul said, there's laid up a crown of righteousness for me, which the righteous judge is going to give me. You see, what you do matters. What you do matters. He says, lay up treasures in heaven, not on earth. He says, if you're seeking wealth, treasures, things uh, here, you'll get it here, but not there. But if you seek treasure there, then when you get there, it's there waiting for you. Guys, it's a simple concept. Most of us miss it. I think when we get to heaven, I think there's going to be a lot more little old ladies in the church with reward than there are preachers. I honestly believe that. I think there's going to be a lot more people that we never have known about that walk this planet given the gospel, loving, serving the bride of Christ, that never make the news that never stand in front of a, a pulpit or behind a microphone, that are going to have a lot of reward in that day because they're faithful. Be faithful, not to a particular thing, but to the work God's called you to. John, back in John chapter 4, verse 36. We're going to get a running start. And he that, re that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, that whereupon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all things ever I did. So the woman went back and said, Jesus said everything. So these guys come out and they hear Jesus speaking. In the meantime, Jesus is saying, don't think you're it. 
I have had other people sow, and you've gotten to go reap what they've sown, and it's not because of your labor. When we go to the farm fair, when we go to do something, it's not because of my labor. We're here because of Bob Hallman's labor, because he spent years and years pouring into this ministry to these people and loving and growing and discipling, and and I get to step into it. I'm so thankful for that. But it's, it's not my labor. And someday I'll be gone. I'll be dead. I'll be old and feebled. Or I'll be called to another ministry like Bob. Someday I'll be gone and somebody else, hopefully, will step in and, and build on that thing, on that ministry. Continue to grow and reach. He says, don't be lifted up thinking you're the guy. Somebody else has started that. You're reaping on that. And he said, verse 39, And many of the Samaritans believed on him for the saying of the woman. So these guys come out and they're believing because of her testimony. And then verse 40, So when the Samaritans were come under him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode two days. And many more believed on him because of his own word. These guys are not believing because of what he did. They're believing because of what he said. That's the reason that he, that he plainly told them he was the Christ. Their hearts were different than the Pharisees. Now, if Jesus had come at a different period of time, Israel would have accepted him and he would have set up a kingdom. The Bible says that in the fullness of time, Christ came. See, God in his sovereignty and knowledge knew what would take place and it was his plan that through the nation of Israel, all the world would be saved and blessed. That's the reason Jesus came when he did. Moving on, John 4 verse 42. And these men of, of, Samaritans, of Samaria said to the, to the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Uh, we want this for ministry. We start by giving testimony and leading someone to Christ. As quickly as we can, we want to move them from us to the Word of God. Guys, I hope you're reading the Word of God every day, every week. That you're building up in the Word of God. John chapter 4, verse 43, And now after two days he departed thence and went unto Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. So he leaves Samaria, Samaria and he travels back to where he was born, travels through Nazareth down to Cana. And when he was coming to Galilee, that's the region, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. Now, see the difference here? When Jesus talked to the Samaritans, he said, I'm the Christ. They accepted him. He spent two days preaching and all believed on him. He gets back to Galilee where he was raised. Now remember, at 12 years old, Jesus is in the temple and he's expounding and teaching the word of God that the Pharisees are just blown away. How does this kid know these things? So you know that rubbing shoulders with him through his teenage years, whether he's building a chair or hanging a door or whatever he's doing, it's pretty incredible. The man understands things about the kingdom of God that no one else does. But the Galileans just were like, nah, it's just Jesus. He's kind of weird. You know, he's just kind of that guy. But then they went to Jerusalem. They saw him kicking out money changers and healing people and doing stuff. And then when he gets back, wow, he's cool. Why? Not because of what he said in Galilee, but because of what he did down in Judea and Jerusalem. So when he gets back, he says a prophet doesn't have honor in his own country. But when he gets back, the guys that had seen what he had done had stirred it around. So everybody wants to come see him. This is the trip. He walks down that peak through the valley, up through Nazareth, and then over into Cana where that wedding was, where we started the book. John chapter 4, verse 46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he had made water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick in Capernaum. And when he had heard that Jesus was come out of Judea and into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. If you're a father, you understand this. If you're not a father or mother, I don't think you can get this. When your son or your daughter gets really sick and there's nothing you can do, it is the most hopeless, helpless, awful thing in the world. I will take anything before I will let my kids get, I just, I hate it. When they get just raging fever and, there's, and I just put my hand on my little baby or my child, they're all still my little babies. I put my hand on my child and I pray for them. Man, my heart goes out like, like it never does for me. Oh, I'm just so, this man is just torn up. His son's sick unto death. He knows he's dying. He leaves Capernaum and he hikes up this mountain as quick as he can. 
and he comes to where Jesus is, and he's just terrified that he's going to lose his son. And he comes to Jesus as soon as Jesus, as he can, after he heard Jesus was getting back into Galilee, and he says, can you come heal my son? And Jesus looks at him and says, if you don't see signs and wonders, you won't believe. He says, basically, you don't have the faith, dude. He says, verse 48, and Jesus said unto him, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman said unto him, sir, come down or my child's going to die. There's no fussing, there's no arguing, there's no doctrine, there's no discussion. Yes, I do have faith. He just said, just save him. He's dying, just save him, just do what you can. If you don't come, he's going to die. And Jesus said, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. The man didn't need a sign. When Jesus said, Go your way, he's healed, the man turned around and he walked off. You know Jesus didn't do things that people didn't believe he could do? You know he's walking through a crowd, and a woman runs up that has an issue of blood. She's had it for a long time, and she thinks, Man, if I could just touch his robe, I'll be healed. So she runs up and she touches the robe. She's healed. Because she believed if she could touch that robe, she'd be healed. He's bumping into all kinds of people that aren't healed. She believed that, so she was healed. This man believed Jesus. And we know that he believed Jesus because he turned around and he went home. So here he is up in Cana of Galilee, and he's from way over there in Capernaum. And he has this trip to go home. He has to drop down 600 feet down the mountain and it's a, a full day, maybe a day and a half journey to get back through the mountain and down there around to Capernaum. And while he's on his way back down to Capernaum, he, he meets these guys and they tell him his son was healed. James chapter 2, verse 14 says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? James says, If you say you believe me, and you don't act on it, your faith is no good. Now he's not saying your act makes your faith, he's saying your faith makes your act. You see, when this man believed God, he turned around and went home. Faith without works is dead. If he said, Lord, I believe you, and then he said, but could you heal my son? Yes, I believe, but can you heal my son? Yes. But he turned around and went home. God healed his son. Faith with works. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. James says, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith with my works. He's not saying that you have to have the works to have faith, but he's saying if I can't see your works, then I don't believe that you have the faith. Faith without works is dead. John 4, verse 51, And as he was now going, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And he believed himself and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judah into Galilee. Faith in Jesus Christ changed the man's whole home. Paul said to the jailer, if you'll believe, you'll be saved and your house. And the man believed in him, and then his house was saved. Out of his belly flowed rivers of living water. Guys, if you'll trust in Jesus Christ, if you'll put your faith in him, if you will come to him and be changed by him, if you lay down your work, your labor, your goodness, your badness, the thing that you don't want to let go of, if you lay it down and you come to Jesus, it changes you. But not just you, it changes people around you. I've seen it again and again and again. It's not a foregone conclusion. Everyone still has free will. But God's not willing that any should perish. And if you're born again and filled with the Spirit of God, it will change your life and change those around you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, your testimony, your goodness. Father, I ask for the ministry out of this church. Lord, you said to uh, the church that we need to do the first works, that we need to be involved in taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world, Lord, because we've forgotten our first love. Lord, remind us of our first love. Father, I pray that you would empower us as the farm fair comes closer. Lord, that we would be taking the gospel 
to our island. Father, I pray that you would uh, cause us to remember to pray for these nations like the Philippines and Papua New Guinea, and Thailand, and so many others, God. Touch our hearts so that we love what you love. Father, I pray that you would uh, go with us this week. Lord, I just again ask for healing and health and blessings on Bob and Becky, direction and guidance as they move to uh, other ministries, Lord, that your name would be glorified there. Thank you so much for the labor that's been given to this place. God, fill us, guide us, use us, direct us, and help us to be called for your purpose. In Jesus' precious name, amen.